Wait, there you go. This is going to work. Hello. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm from the Wellcome Trust. I'm a PhD student there uh, and affiliated with Cambridge as well. And I'm happy to be in Japan for the second time. I was at a biohackathon or another hackathon, this one actually focusing on the, on the topic of this talk and in Sendai uh, about four months ago. Okay, so uh, I'm interested in genome informatics. And so, I, I mean, I understand that not everyone here is in the same boat. It's a little bit boring from some perspective, but I think it has huge ramifications for all kinds of biological inference problems. And so the, the question I can start with is, is when does a linear reference system fail? We use these systems all the time. We, we have a, you know, one human genome that we kind of map all things against, and we talk about gene models in the, in the basis of that system. We do this for every model organism that we come across, and Whenever we see a new organism, we try to make a linear reference out of some sequencing data in it, even if that's not necessarily appropriate. Like it might be a, some system that doesn't really have one genome. Anyway, so when does this really fall down? There's a simple example. It's if you have a large divergence in sequence. And so in this case, we have uh, in the top, these are alignments from the Thousand Genomes Project. They were done with BWA Align, but with BWA MEM, you get something very similar. Um, and some methods that we applied to the data found a large deletion at the locus. And in fact, they found another polymorphism, a small deletion as well. And, and no method actually found all these, these different states at the same time. So you're kind of blinding yourself to one or the other. But if you, if you know that these are present in the population and you make a reference system that includes them, which is sort of outlined in the middle here, we have um, the references across the top and then you have the deletion and the one with the small deletion from the bottom. If you realign the reads to this, then you just natively pick up these these alleles, right? So we've now reduced the problem of finding these, these, div these really divergent alleles to uh, exact matching against the reference graph. And so the, seeing that this is a big problem for this space has inspired some development in the past few years into what we're calling uh, variation graphs or genome reference graphs or genome graphs. And the, the basic idea is you have some, some mathematical model that looks a lot like DNA in that it has two strands. And, and you, can, you can think about inversions against it, and you can think about multiplicities where there might be bifurcations in the system. And the bifurcation, you could go left to right, and if you go left, you're one genome, if you go right, you're another. And this, this uh, sketch kind of illustrates that, where the, this purple and, and green sequences are different, but the rest of the genome is, is very similar. So we have the system that encodes both variation and sequence at the same time. And the essential pieces of it are the variation in the sequence, but also records of what genomes you put into it. Because if you, if you lose that information about what you put in, then you're going to end up uh, having a very degenerate system. So on the bottom we have this graph. We're, we're sort of running across the top of it in, in the way we're thinking about it, which you could imagine going in the reverse complement direction as well. And there's embedded SNPs and kind of indels happening. And then we've, we've recorded all the sequences we built it from as well, and we need to use those later. So these are the essential components of this kind of system. And conceptually, these are, are really familiar, in fact, because multiple sequence alignments, with a partially ordered graph can be described. So you know, a multiple sequence alignment is possibly described as a partially ordered graph. Here you have a, an MSA that's described in matrix format at the top. You can think of a consensus sequence. So those are the, the linear sequences we want to project out of the thing so we can make coordinates against it, but we don't have to do that. We could um, compress it into a graph where all the matching positions are, are contiguous. And so this, this is really what we're talking about, but it is a little more complicated because while we're at it, we might as well represent any kind of, of sequence graph. And that could be a graph that's not just a, a directed acyclic graph, but one that has cycles in it, and possibly one that has inversions in it, because then we can compactly represent all sequence and variation at the same time. And this is nice because these, these objects are pretty well understood. <clears throat> they're, uh, they're used in, in sequence assembly problems, and uh, we can sort of work off the back of, of these kinds of algorithms if we, could, if we could use this as a reference system. So we've been doing this in a system called VG. VG is, it kind of sort of stands for variation graph, but it's also short because it's meant to be a command line utility that you can use to engage in resequencing operations against these kinds of systems. So you can make a graph, you can transform it in various ways, depending on your needs. Um, so by, by making a graph, we mean actually taking 
some data format that's equivalent to the graph or something that implies a graph, like a FASTA file with a bunch of homologous sequences. We can assemble those. Uh, we could also read RDF in, and we can produce RDF. So there's a lossless transformation to RDF. And uh, so then you can index it and then use the index to engage in certain kinds of query operations. Uh, to, you can map reads to it and, and finally do something that looks a lot like variant calling. Variant calling being genotyping. And it's a hugely uh, distributed project as well. So we have participants here, some here in Japan, and uh, some in California, and some at the Sanger Institute, and some in Europe as well. And, and we're each focusing on different diverse aspects of the system that we're sort of using it to scratch our itches. And the way that this practically works, this is a practical system. You can actually map whole genomes with it. You can work with large graphs. And, and we've done that by uh, first starting out with a core system that is meant to work on small graphs. Which actually the, the way that everything's glued together is that most things you can do in a small graph, you can then do them in parallel across a larger graph. And, and so then there's uh, different indexing systems that are, are <coughs> implemented to make, to make a, a very compact representation of these kind of graphs. There's the XG index, which is it's a mutable kind of data store for the graph. And then there's the GPWT which is actually going to be talked about by Adam in the next talk, so I'll leave it to him. And, and then there's a query system that is a kind of generalization of the FM index that will allow us to do any kind of string lookup operations you could have done on a linear sequence. You can now do them on the graph. And in practice, this does help. So the, these experiments show a yeast pan genome that was constructed from, from a VCF file, so a list of the the alleles and the reference that, that these are against from something like 24 yeast strains. And then uh, looking at the yeast strains, we can ask if that graph provides better match for the sequences in, in each strain. And it does. And we can tell that because uh, if we were to take an example. So each one of these pairs of plots is representing one strain. On this, on this plot, we see on this side here, and these, we're mapping from BWA map. And, and this is the VG map mapper. And they have the same parameterization, they get the same scores for pretty much. And sorry, these, each point is an alignment score in both. And so they're, they're tightly correlated. If we map against just the linear reference, but if we have VG uh, mapping against the pan genome, then the scores improve. They're being shifted this way. And that is indicative of a better match between the sequences you have and the reference you're using, which is only a good thing. So, and this is consistent across all the strains we've looked at. So the, the way that you can go from, so that the mapping to some, some extent works and we can incorporate new information into the reference and work with that. And, and so then you want to then project down at some further compressed format that you could use to drive annotation and analysis downstream. And so the implementation that we've settled on is a first pass and developed. Uh, Glenn, who's also in the room, is a primary author of this is to make a kind of pilot format across the graph. And we can use that to see where there's certain variants. Actually, I have a pointer, Pretty cool. Yeah, and then uh, you can make, you can imagine that there's like a sample graph, which would be just the part of the graph supported by, by uh, the reason that individual. But if you retain well, the previous graph as well, it's this kind of augmented system. And if you retain the reference sequence, you can project out into something that is compatible with existing systems, so a VCF file in this case. And this does also work, and at least its site detection works very well. So these are, this is an experiment from the MHC, uh, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. We have been um, in the data working group. We've engaged in a kind of community-driven analysis of different ways to make these sort of graphs. And we've used VG as a, a test harness to, <coughs> to understand the performance of the graphs comparatively. And basically, the, the point, the takeaway from this is that this is about site detection, so our sensitivity to, to variants in the NA12878 individual in the MHC. And uh, when we use the 1,000 genomes graph as our, so this is a, the VCF that was produced by the project, when you use that as our, our base reference, we actually have uh, higher sensitivity and specificity than, than any other method. And, and this is really promising. But... Um, it's only the start because we also need to get the accurate genotypes, 
out of the system, and we need to, to work on, on detecting longer alleles appropriately. <coughs> none, of, none of which has really gotten at the, by this. Uh, so we, we do know that we get, get better detection of longer alleles. We can see that by looking at the length frequency distribution of, of the uh, output calls made by this. And you can basically see this is zoomed in in this region um, for cactus and thousand genomes graphs. So to do with the different constructions we used, we have higher sensitivity than against just using a primary reference. Um, and then we've, we've actually applied this whole genome to do a whole genome analysis, so across the entire entire system, and this was uh, then compared against a, the, the genome in a bottle call set, that, which is a, a standard description of the variation in this individual. And we don't do terribly well. We get around 95% F-score, and uh, we think that this is mostly due to genotyping failure, but we're improving. So we can also uh, resequence against totally generic graphs, so not just directed acyclic ones, but ones that have cycles, and, and this little motif here describes a, a nested cyclic structure in a graph where we go from one base to another and then back to the first one. And we can unroll that, sort of pre-compute the different paths through it up to some length, and, and then align reads against this system, and the mappings will still be valid against the first. And this then allows us to work with arbitrary graphs. So you could, you could imagine um, assembling a metagenome and then mapping to it. And then I've tested this out in... Um, in a progressive long read assembly algorithm. And the idea is that you, you can sort of exploit all the different aspects of the system to make assemblies. And that you know, validates that the whole thing's working. The idea is that you take uh, some input graph or sequence and you will progressively, progressively align more sequences to it, editing the graph to then include them. And we can do this for a lot of sequences and um, yeah, provides a, a way to directly import finish reference sequences that are <coughs> from related or homologous regions into, the, into this format. And here's some visualizations of it, just as a validation of the process. So yeah, this is a, a gene from the MHC. And uh, basically, you get around 7x compression in the graph relative to the raw sequences. There's a lot of redundancy, but there's, there's also a lot of, um, a lot of information that's, that's not shared. This is a more extensive example. Second, and uh, because because these are graphs, we and you know they're arbitrary, like they're not just uh, directed acyclic graphs. We can resequence against circular genomes, like like for, for viral uh, viral uh, sequences. And okay, so that's uh, kind of a whirlwind introduction. But there's a bunch of open problems. If if you find this interesting. It, it's a huge project. It's, it's really about rebooting all of genomics, not just, not just kind of tweaking a little bit at the bottom of it. Because we need to, if we want to really work this way, and it looks like it makes sense, we need to generalize a lot of tools, a lot of concepts to work within, within these kinds of systems. And so, for example, uh, we're going to work on haplotype-based variant calling at this hackathon. Um, instead of working with pileups, this will allow for better resolution. Um, also, uh, the using assembly graphs is possible. But they're not, they're not normalized in an appropriate way for a lot of things we want to do. And so that's an open problem. Um, and that's related to normalization. Like, given a set of sequences, is there some canonical graph that we can come up with? Um, this is something that Benedict and Adam have, have both worked on. But it's still open. Another idea that's come up a lot is, is like, do you want to find the ancestral genome? And now that becomes much more possible, much more easy in the graph, because you can put everything into the same context without bias toward the reference this kind of joint bias. Um, and in theory, you should be able to find the ancestral genome in a, in a much clearer way, especially dealing with indels. Another problem is that distances in these graphs don't make sense like they do on a linear reference, because you, you know, you, unless you've recorded a path that covers most of the graph, which is the case for our, our graphs based on the thousand genomes, then you have to walk, in fact, to find how far it is between things. And so that, this is a problem that's been dealt with in, uh, in other spaces, but um, you know, we, we need to have a solution here, because without it, we can't generalize everything. And uh, also, so we have this export into some semantic web compatible technologies or formats, but uh, maybe some of our applications could actually provide endpoints and certain, answer certain kinds of queries, because they can do, they can do this much more efficiently, perhaps, than, than uh, an abstract triple store. Uh, and then finally, there's this issue of SV detection. So in theory, these also look like small variants, but you know, they're also a little bit different. 
because you have to do transformations to the graph that maybe smooth it so you can think about much larger structures and not get distracted by the small ones. So uh, with that, yeah, thanks to everyone who's helped on this, and thanks for having me.